hours while they worked to put out the fire, a lot of the evidence was obliterated and washed away from the water. These innocent, mistake, innocent mistakes could prove to be costly in the years to come. Austin investigators worked with what they had, of course, trying to piece together exactly what happened that night. But for over a week, they had no leads. Their first break actually came from a local teenager, Maurice Pierce, who was 16 at the time. And he was caught at a nearby mall called North Cross, carrying a 22 caliber gun. When he was questioned, he bragged that the gun was used to kill the yoga shop girls. He said that his friend, Forrest Wellburn, who was 15, gave him the pistol. But after police wired Pierce and listened in on a conversation between him and Wellborn, it was obvious that Forrest had no idea what Pierce was getting at. And one of the homicide detectives said, quote, It was obvious to everyone Pierce was trying to force the issue on Wellborn, who had no idea what he was talking about. End quote. Wellborn was brought in for questioning, of course, and although he passed a polygraph, he mentioned two other teens, a Michael Scott and a Rob Springsteen, both 17 at the time. Wellborn said that he traveled with the teens in a stolen Nissan Pathfinder just days after the murder, but with no evidence to link them to the crime, the case stalled. Authorities let Pierce off the hook after ballistics he had, ballistics on the gun that he had, didn't match up. And it was sort of noted that he had some kind of mental illness, but I couldn't find out exactly what it was. I couldn't find any official diagnosis or anything like that. So, five years later, despite thousands of tips pouring in, the case remained unsolved. Now, in 1996, a new detective named Paul Johnson took over. And while he was searching through numerous tips, Pierce's name stood out. He started an FBI profile for the murders and brought in Pierce Scott Springsteen L. Wellborn for questioning. All of them denied any involvement in the murders at first. After a series of intense interrogations, Scott was the first to break, and he admitted that he had helped carry out the murders. According to Scott, both Pierce and Springsteen brought a gun to the yogurt shop, planning to just rob it, while Wellborn acted as a lookout and stayed in the car. Scott said he took a gun from Pierce at some point after Pierce began yelling at the girls for money. He also indicated that Springsteen hit one of the girls and sexually assaulted her. As another girl began screaming for her life, Scott said he shot her in the head at Pierce's insistence. And he then remembered running out the door to the getaway car while the yogurt shop began to catch fire. He stated that Wellborn had apparently fled the scene while they were inside. In 1999, all four men were charged with the capital murder. Springsteen admitted to shooting one of the girls, but Pierce and Wellborn never admitted to the killings, and they were let go. The problem remained that most of the evidence had been washed away years ago by the fire department, and aside from their confessions, detectives had nothing to go on. Regardless, Prosecutors won their case based on confessions and circumstantial evidence. Springsteen was sentenced to death, and Scott was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Well, at this point you'd think, okay, case is closed. It was only the beginning. In 2006, Springsteen, Springsteen's sentence was reduced from death to life in prison without parole. And in 2007, new testing revealed an unknown man's DNA on the youngest victim, Amy. Investigators 
usually change them to other words, but uh, this was like every other, I would be bleeping out whole sentences, so yeah, I don't really know reading the typescript of the confessions, I could see how they got it thrown out. Where's the justice for these four girls? (laughs) 